chapter number two we continue on in our study in the book of the revelation we're still just kind of getting started here but we've come to the letters to the churches and we're starting our study with this uh, letter to the church at ephesus in revelation chapter two so i'm going to read for our text from verse one down through verse number seven and then we'll pray together then we'll see what the lord has for our teaching and our understanding uh, this evening revelation chapter two beginning with verse number one the Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the Word of God this evening. We thank you again for allowing us the privilege, the opportunity to gather together in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. We pray now that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, in this wonderful book of the Revelation, uh, just speak to us, Lord, and, and help us and draw us closer to yourself. Help us to learn more of your word that we might apply it to our hearts and to our lives, that we might live lives that would be pleasing to, to thee. Lord, that you might use us for, for thy glory. We pray as always for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and for revival to come. And we'll thank you, Lord, for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, to the church at Ephesus. Uh, that's where this letter is going. And it's going to the church where John was the former pastor. Uh, John was pastor of the church at Ephesus before his exile to this island of Patmos where the Lord appears to him, gives him the revelation to record for us. It's the church in Ephesus. The word Ephesus is interesting that you can find out the word Ephesus uh, actually means to fall away or to draw back. To fall away or to draw back. And you know, when you read this letter that the Lord has for this particular church, it's a very fitting description of the church uh, to fall away or to draw back. Earlier, uh, this same church in Ephesus had received a letter from the Apostle Paul. And it's in our Bible, the letter to the Ephesians. It's a letter of strong doctrine and spiritual truth. Uh, Ephesus had been a spiritual church, but by the words of Jesus in the letter that he sends to them here, uh, evidently Ephesus somehow uh, has become a church that has lost its spiritual passion and was worthy of a strong reproof from the Lord. Notice again verse, five, or verse 4 and verse 5 where Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That's some strong words there. Verse 5 also, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, 
and repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. That's some strong words there, is it not? Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'll, I'll remove the candlestick. Now that doesn't mean that he'll take away uh, the, the people's salvation, but it does mean he'll take away the influence of that church, that that church could basically just dry up on the vine, and, uh, and churches do that, sad to say, and uh, that's what is happening here. And so it's some strong words that Jesus makes to the church, words of, of reproof. And like, like many churches today, this was a church that was in need of revival. Can you say amen to that? They obviously was in need of revival. And the letter itself can be divided into three sections. First of all, there's the identification, which we've looked at already in verse number one. And then verses two and three is a section concerning commendation. And then verse four through verse seven deals with exhortation. And so you can divide the letter up that way. But before we actually get into the, the, the teaching that we find in the letter itself and the words of commendation and the words of exhortation that the Lord has for the church here in the letter, I'd like for us to learn some things about the background, about the uh, setting of the church at Ephesus here. And so think with me about the background, the background of the community. Uh, it was early in the first century. And actually, you can find, even in sources outside of the Bible, uh, historical writings and sources and all for, from that time of history, Ephesus was a city that had a reputation. It had a reputation of a very important city. For one thing, it was important commercially because it was, it was a well-known city of trade. Uh, one of the greatest seaports in the ancient world uh, was there in that city of Ephesus. And there were trade routes uh, from the east by way of Colossae and Laodicea. There's a road that came down from the north that brought trade from Asia Minor that went through the area of Galatia and by the way of Sardis and Smyrna. And there's a road also that came up from the south bringing trade from the city of Miletus. And so Ephesus really was somewhat of a crossroads type of city. Uh, a lot of trade uh, routes and, and uh, the seaport that was there. A lot of activity, a lot of commercial activity that was going on there. And so Ephesus was no small little town. Uh, Ephesus was a, a bustling trade center uh, of a city in that day. And so it was important commercially. It was important politically. Uh, the city of Ephesus, uh, we can learn, was actually called in, uh, the supreme metropolis of Asia. It was known as a free city, what was called a free city in that day. You see, this was the time of the Roman Empire. Remember, the Romans were still in control of basically all of the known world in that day. And, and so it was still in that time. But Ephesus was known as a free city. See, the Roman government had granted that right to the city of Ephesus, the right of self-government. Uh, it did not have to deal with the presence and the control of the Roman military, uh, such as other places in the world in the first century there. And uh, so it didn't have to worry about things like that. Uh, they had their own magistrates. They had their own uh, elected government. They had their own officials. Ephesus had the distinction of being a host city for, uh, for an athletic event. And if I remember right, it, it was something called, something like the uh, Pan Pannonian Games, which was in that day like the Olympic Games that we, that we have today. They would have that there in the city of Ephesus. They would host that. There would be uh, many, many people, at, at, most, most likely thousands of people uh, that would come into that city for those, uh, uh, those Olympic-type games, those uh, athletic events there in the city. They'd come from all over to participate. They would come from all over uh, as, uh, as fans, you know, to watch it. And, and you can understand that in our society today and the emphasis that sporting events has today and, and uh, a big sporting event in a community, you know, that's a big thing. 
You know, when a city has the Super Bowl, they say that's a huge thing to the business owners and so forth there uh, of, the, of the money that it makes. Uh, and, and so this was that type of a city, the city of Ephesus. Uh, Paul the Apostle often used the analogy of sports in his own preaching. If you remember what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, let me read it for you, beginning with verse 24 and, and, uh, and going down through verse 27. Paul wrote this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should, should be a castaway. And so Paul uses that, that illustration of an athletic event and actually applies it uh, to the Christian life and to his ministry as an apostle and as a uh, missionary and living his life for the Lord Jesus. And, and then there's also Hebrews chapter 12, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, and there you remember how the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And there is the illustration, really the picture of a great crowd in the, in the stadium and uh, watching you run the race. And, and so we apply that uh, passage of Scripture, and I think it's good to apply it this way, to those who have run the race already and finished it ahead of us, and they've gone to heaven, they've died in the Lord, they're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're like in that, in that uh, in, in the bleachers cheering us on and watching us run the race. You see, Paul uses that, that type of terminology in his writing. Suppose why would he do that? Because he was living in a day when people would understand such things. They would know how to apply that. Uh, they were, uh, can I just say it this way for lack of a better way of saying it? They were probably as crazy about sports as, as we are today, as people are today. Uh, they enjoyed it. They loved it. They would attend the games and the activities and so forth. So Paul was using this uh, knowledge of the people, something that they could relate to. He would use it in his writing, in his teaching, his preaching. And so it was important uh, commercially. It was important politically. It was important religiously. Uh, Ephesus was important religiously. It was the home of the temple of the what was called the goddess Diana. And in that day, it was known as one of the seven uh, wonders of the world. You've heard that, uh, state, that, that term before, the seven wonders of the world. It was the pride of that city of Ephesus. I, I found out uh, when, you, when you see this uh, uh, background of this, uh, this temple of Diana, it was 425 foot long 220 foot wide and 60 foot high. Now that's a pretty good size um, uh, barn, and I mean that's a pretty good size warehouse. That's a pretty good size building. 425 foot long, 220 foot wide, and 60 feet high. Now I meant to look this up so I'd be so you would think that I would uh, you know know a little bit about about things, but uh, uh, I forgot to look it up. But that sounds like that's almost two acres to me. It sounds like it's in the neighborhood of sitting on two acres. Isn't two acres a 210 by 210, something like that? I mean, an acre, like two, 210 foot by 210 foot? That, that's what I, I think our brother Doug's not his head. So I know more than you, than you thought it did. And uh, so this is, this is really like two acres then, isn't it? It'd be if you 220 foot wide, 420 foot deep, well, I guess it would need to be, well, if, if an acre is uh, 210 by 210, that would be two acres. And uh, so can you imagine that? That building is covering two acres of ground. And it was the temple of the goddess Diana. That's the kind of community this place of Ephesus was. And so that's the background of it. But then think with me about the beginning of the church. 
we have a lot of scriptural information about the church in Ephesus, the church that this letter is being directed to. And it's covered in Acts, the book of Acts chapter 18 through chapter number 20. And uh, in Acts chapter 18, if you go back and you study that once again, you remember how that after spending a year and a half in Corinth, Paul the apostle came to Ephesus and he brought Priscilla and Aquila with him when he went to Ephesus. And then he left them there for a while while he went on to Caesarea, then on to Antioch, and then over to the country of Galatia. And then when you come to Acts chapter 19, Paul returns to Ephesus to preach in the synagogue there for a period of three months. And like most everywhere else that he went and preached on his missionary journeys, uh, it wasn't long that, that uh, opposition arose against him. And they began to oppose him. And we can read that. In fact, I want us to look at some of this, get this background in our thoughts about the city of Ephesus itself and the church there at Ephesus. Acts chapter 19. You will look at Acts chapter 19. You'll see there that he had the opposition of hardened hearts. The opposition of hardened hearts. Acts chapter 19 and verse 8 and verse 9. And he went into the synagogue and, sp and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers uh, were hardened, that would mean like different people, uh, when divers or different people were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of, what, uh, of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one uh, Tyrannus. And so they were, they were hardened and they believed not. These were people that for whatever reason just seemed to have hard hearts they, they, towards the gospel. They just were not going to believe. They weren't going to hear. It's like they didn't care to hear any more of it. They would refuse to believe. And the thing about it is, let's be honest with ourselves, folks, there is nothing nothing worse for an individual to have than a hard heart. Can you say amen to that? It's the worst thing that, that, you, could, that you could ever have. Uh, in fact, over in Hebrews chapter number 3, Hebrews chapter 3, and uh, I'll read quite a few verses there if you want to follow along. Hebrews chapter 3, we're really given this warning, and uh, it's written to try to help us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now that's referring back to the time, of, and, uh, and we actually talked about it this morning uh, in, our, in the Sunday school uh, lesson today about the rebellion of the people of Israel in, at Kadesh Barnea. And uh, this is the provocation in the, and the day of temptation in the wilderness. Uh, verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. So they wandered in the desert 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation said, they do always err, and watch the words, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. And you know, people need to hear that today. People need to hear today, don't harden your hearts. Don't, don't turn a, a, a deaf ear to the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Open your heart and open your ears and open your mind. Over and over in the letters in the Revelation, Jesus says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the, to the churches. And so we need to hear the gospel. We need to hear the message of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ and not harden our hearts to it. But that was going on there uh, in Ephesus for the Apostle Paul. There were those that were hardened in their hearts. And so they opposed his preaching of the gospel. And then there was the opposition of imitation. The opposition of imitation also in Acts chapter 19 
Acts chapter 19, if you'll notice, uh, we'll pick up uh, close to where we were at. We read verse 8, verse number 9, and uh, uh, we'll pick up with verse 11. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, uh, a Jew, and uh, chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? I always get tickled when I read that uh, passage of Scripture there. I can just kind of picture uh, this thing in my mind. The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on, all, on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was, uh, was magnified. And, and so there were these that, that they, tried, they basically tried to copy what the Apostle Paul and the disciples of the Lord were doing it's an old trick of the devil. You ever heard that little uh, saying, if you can't beat them, join them? It's a, it's, a, it's a trick of the devil. And there are a lot of imitators today. Uh, there are a lot of sheep in, in a, in a, or, or wolves in sheep's clothing uh, today. Uh, in fact, Jesus warned his disciples in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, uh, but inwardly they are uh, ravening wolves. And Paul also warned the Ephesian elders back in, in, in uh, Acts chapter number 20, looking at Acts chapter number 20 now, and verse number 29 there, uh, he said this, uh, Paul said this to them, uh, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And it's interesting, the next verse, verse 30, he said to them, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. And so it's really a trick of the devil that, uh, uh, that he uh, can oppose the uh, preaching of the gospel by imitation. If he can't beat them, join them. And so he puts his wolves in sheep's clothing right in the church itself false prophets, false teachers, and so forth within the church. Such opposition there in Ephesus. And then also in Ephesus, there is the opposition of materialism and false religion. Materialism and false religion. Back in Acts chapter 19, 19 once again. And let me read from verse 23 down through uh, verse number 29. Acts chapter 19, verse 23, down through verse 29. And at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. That way is the way of Jesus Christ. It's talking about Christianity. It's talking about followers of Jesus. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth, Moreover, you see and hear that not uh, alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. When they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion, having caught Gaius and, and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. Uh, they rushed with one accord uh, into the theater. And, and so materialism and false religion. You know, you saw at the beginning of that text there the problem that this guy, Demetrius, the silversmith, had was that he was losing money. Amen. He was losing money. And he gathers them together. But he makes a big deal out of, it, it's not just our money, but it's our goddess Diana that is being, being heard. And so they use that false religion really as an excuse 
to stir up the city. But the whole problem there, I believe, was this uh, thing of materialism. And is that not a picture of American culture today? The worship of the almighty dollar. It's like what the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and verse number 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The Bible does not say that money is, uh, is evil. Uh, money uh, can, it is used for good. Uh, the, the church needs money. Uh, ministry needs money. Missionaries needs money. Uh, money is used for good. It's used for the work of the Lord. The problem is this thing of the love of money of always having to have to have more and more and more. And really, it's, a, it's, it's American culture today. That's where we're at today. Do you notice this? Have you noticed as we're looking at this that Ephesus really was not much different than this time we're living in right now, was it? Really, it was, it was, it was just like it. And so you see the background of the community and then the beginning of the church. But how did the church actually start? What was the birth of the church like? Let's think about that uh, tonight, the birth of the church at Ephesus. Paul said to the elders of the church at Ephesus back in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, Remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so the church in Ephesus was born uh, with the preaching of the apostle Paul. It also involved the witnessing of Priscilla and Aquila, Paul's companions there, and the preaching of Apollos. You remember reading in the book of Acts of the man uh, Apollos, a uh, uh, very eloquent uh, preacher and, and could debate the Jews, you know, and use the Old Testament scriptures in a marvelous way. He did some preaching there in Ephesus as well. And so that was the birth of the church in Ephesus, but... When we look at Acts chapter 19, and I'd like for you to turn back there once again. But in Acts chapter 19, once again, you'll see that the church in Ephesus, now, now watch this, because this is where we're going to see it come into the words that Jesus has for the church in the letter here in Revelation chapter 2. The church, uh, the birth of the church in Ephesus was literally, it was literally birth in a revival. It was revival that broke out in Ephesus. And that's how that church began. Notice in Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, verses 18, uh, and, uh, 18 through 20. Acts chapter 19, verses 18 through 20. And here the Bible says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. What is that a description of? It's a description of revival. First of all, it says there are many that believe and these, and these that believe, they confess their sins. They show their deeds. They brought their curious arts and their books. You see, the goddess Diana was really a, a satanic cult. And after all, the Bible tells us that, that the worship of any idol is the worship of a demon. Did you know that? It's demon worship is what it really is. And so there are curious arts. These were, these were occultic uh, materials. And, and we have that in the world today. And so they brought these things. They knew that these things were uh, would not was not pleasing to to God. That they have now found uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and responding uh, to the preaching of the Apostle Paul and his companions and their witness uh, there in Ephesus. 
They, they knew that these things that they had in their homes, these things that they had in their lives, these things that they had used for all this time in that uh, devilish worship of the so-called goddess of Diana, they knew that this was wrong. And so what did they do? They burned them. They got rid of them. They destroyed them. And see, the thing about it is, that, dear friend, is a real sign of revival. Uh, there has been such happenings uh, in, uh, in, in modern history of the church uh, today, uh, even in the last, in, in this, in our lifetime, in our generation. Uh, there have been churches that would experience a revival. There would be great preaching, a revival. And people would, uh, people would bring their, uh, 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 their rock and roll records and, and, and things like that and burn them. They would bring their videos and their magazines and their books and things that were not pleasing to the Lord and get rid of it. I, I, I preached a, a revival meeting in uh, uh, North Carolina uh, one time many years ago. This was last century, way back last century, 1990-something or another, I guess it was. And uh, I was preaching in North Carolina. And, uh, and, and the Lord blessed. It was a good meeting. A lot of people respond. Uh, a lot of people in the church uh, rededicating their lives and a number of people getting saved. And it was a little church in North Carolina. And, and one of the services, uh, after the service, as people had gone, I noticed that on the, on, on the platform, at, at the, the altar, you know, in the church, that on that altar in the church was a pack of cigarettes and cigarette lighter. <laughs> and I found out later that it was actually uh, the family. There's a family that had this, uh, they, they ran this camp that had something to do with the insurance company. And they had a camp that they directed and they had these cabins and they were members of the church and all there. And so uh, I would stay in one of those cabins there. And it was that family that I was uh, staying with. And it was, it was the, the, the man's wife, you know, there. And, uh, and she got rid of those cigarettes. And it was later, uh, a few years later, I think it might have been a couple of years later or whatever, uh, was, uh, went back to that church. And, uh, and Michelle was with me the, the next time when I went back. And uh, I remember asking the, uh, uh, the lady about, about that day, you know, remembering that. And she said, yeah, and she never picked them up again. <laughs> never picked up a cigarette again. Got rid of it. And see, that was just something. That is really a picture of revival because it's something that God spoke to the heart of an individual and dealt with their hearts and they did something about it. That's what was going on in Ephesus. And so when Jesus says in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 2, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Here's what the problem was. The church in Ephesus had lost its passion for revival. Lost its passion for revival. Lost their passion for righteousness and their passion for preaching. In Ephesus, back in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 19, verse 20 says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And so there was a time when they loved the preaching. They loved the word of God. The word of God grew and prevailed in their lives and changed their lives. Something had happened in between. And I think that that's what, I think that it's a, it's a very good picture of America today because I can remember even my lifetime days when people loved the preaching of the word of God. Communities would love revival meetings. Uh, uh, you would hear of them happening. There'd be times when you'd have a, a community like our size of a community here. One church would have revival meeting and ever, the whole community would be coming out and, and there would be all kinds of things that would be happening for the glory of the Lord. Uh, the word of God would prevail but we're not living in such a day today. America's lost its love for preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21, the Bible says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Uh, we've gone in America, in modern day churches, we've gone from preaching to patronizing to pacifying. 
And that's a sad commentary, but that's basically what the modern church as a whole in America, regardless of denomination, that's, a, that's basically what the modern church in America is doing today. And so what do we do? Jesus gives the answer here in his letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus, so much like us, Jesus gives the answer, and the answer is remember, repent, and repeat. Remember, repent, repeat. Look at verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. In other words, remember, repent, repeat. Just go back and do what you used to do. Go back and be what you used to be. That's the answer. I believe that's the answer for America. We, that's America, the answer for America's churches. We must get back to revival and we must get back to a love for the preaching of the Word of God. That's what he says to the church at Ephesus and it's what we need to do. Can I give you one verse in the Old Testament and we'll close Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Oh, how I wish that we could really take to heart this verse in the churches in America today. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Get back to the old paths. Go back to the love of revival and of the preaching of the Word of God. Get back to the old ways. That's the good way. Not this modern way of entertainment and pacifying people and, and patronizing people and, and you know, uh, make people feel so good when they come to church. The truth of the matter is, when you come to church, I understand what you say when, when you say the, the sermon was good to you or blessing, uh, blessing to you and so forth. And, and I understand that, and, and always glad to hear that. But you know it needs to step on our toes from time to time too, amen? And, and really that is good for us. It's good to recognize that when it stirs our hearts, steps on our toes, makes us think about something that God is dealing with us in our own individual lives about that we need to repent of and we need to see a change in, that in itself is a good day in the house of God, amen? A lot of people today don't want to hear that though. They'll say you stepped on my toes and they don't want to hear anymore. They won't come back. They want to stay with uh, this new thing, new stuff that they've got now. We need to get back to the old ways. We just need to get back to the, uh, to the uh, love of revival and of the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. Just get back, get back to it. Re uh, repent and, and, uh, and, and, and then and then uh, Repeat, remember, repent, repeat. Revelation 2 verse 5. That's the answer for the church at Ephesus. It's the answer for the church today. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, uh, church, and we'll pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the word of God this evening. Thank you for the time that you've given us to be together. And Lord, we thank you for our study in the book of the Revelation and for this first letter to the church at Ephesus that there's much more that we need to see and learn from it. But Lord, it is, it is the background of the city, everything about it is so much like the day we're living in right now. And their problem really is our problem, uh, losing the passion for revival and for the preaching of the word of God. Lord, help us as a people in this nation of America today in 2021. Help us to get back to it. Get back to your word. Get back to the preaching. Get back to revival stirring our hearts and our lives once again. And Lord, we just pray that you would let us see that in these last days, see revival come. We'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing the song together as Brother Tim leads us. Page 306. Thank you. 